introduction and hello, hello to everyone. So my talk will cover psychedelic microdosing. And uh, interestingly, it happens to me that I often end up in conversations with actually random people, strangers, who tell me about their microdosing experience without me actually telling them what I'm doing as a job. And I noticed there are two very opposing opinions on it. So some people find it to be life changing and they really believe into its potential and generally have a very high opinion on psychedelics. And others think it's completely bollocks. So they say it doesn't make any sense pharmacologically and it's all a placebo effect. And this picture is currently also reflected in the scientific literature. So I'm really intrigued. So because we simply don't know yet whether people report to feel better because of the pharmacological effect of a microdose or whether they simply expect to be better and these claimed benefits are largely driven by the placebo effect. So first of all, to start, what is microdosing? So microdosing um, describes the regular, uh, regular intake of very low doses of psychedelics. And this happens often for an extended time period, can be weeks, months, up to years. And people usually dose every third and fourth day um, and take five to 10% of an ordinary dose. And the idea is that the dose is too low to induce obvious drug effects. So the effects are kind of sub-perceptual, but high enough um, to beneficially alter psychological functioning. What sounds a bit contradictory in itself, but that's the original idea of it. Um, and interestingly, microdosing has been promoted to be the new smart drug and a biohack for productivity and creativity. And it's not rare that people often try to self-medicate and manage their mental health with the help of microdosing. And um, you could actually say that the reports of the effects of microdosing are a little bit too good to be true because people report positive mood effects, uh, positive effects on well-being, improved relationships and increased appreciation for nature, enhanced cognition, creativity and productivity. Um, so as you can imagine, with all these positive anecdotes circulating, microdosing has gained uh, overwhelmingly positive attention from the media. And since the first introduction of the concept, there have been several books, uh, news articles, documentaries um, that have been published and are promoting its effectiveness. And all this attention, of course, leads to a pretty strong belief formation about the positive effects of microdosing. And as you may know, with strong beliefs comes a large potential for placebo effects. However, generally, it can be said at the moment, there is no scientific um, consensus on what microdosing actually is. So we don't know what is a safe and effective long-term long dosing schedule, what doses should be applied. And current uh, research is gaining traction, but it's still in, in its infancy. Um, so basically, at present, people are kind of self-experimenting uh, without an empirically grounded database. Um, and so far at Imperial, we've been conducting two uh, studies. Um, one of those was uh, first web-based observational inv investigation of um, people who microdose over a period for four to six weeks. Um, and here we track the uh, experience of 81 uh, participants from before, during and after they completed the microdosing regime. And to cut it short, so we had two very main findings in the end. We found significant increases in well-being that were accompanied by significant decreases in depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms, self-reported symptoms. Um, but we also found that the expectations for well-being improvement were significantly associated with those changes. So as we hypothesized, um, the positive expectations at baseline were driving or seemed to be driving these effects. And this is very suggestive of, of a role of like a large expectancy or placebo effect. And overall, these results uh, that fo were found in this study are in line with other observational studies that, are la that largely support um, the claims about microdosing. However, as the name says, these studies are observational. That means they're not experimental experimentally controlled and observe a phenomenon that is naturally occurring. So that means in the end that these results have to be taken with a grain of salt, as there are a number of methodological limitations. And this makes it hard to distinguish drug from placebo effects. So in our little pyramid here, uh, our survey study lies somewhere around here. Um, and at present, there are only very few properly controlled scientific uh, studies, so-called um, double-blind randomized controlled trials. 
which have addressed this this, this issue and um, so to speak there was not much compelling evidence about positive effects of microdosing but also not negative effects so it was basically a null effect and as a first step to bridge uh, the knowledge gap my colleague uh, Balash he came up with a pretty smart idea of a novel study design that can be seen as a mix of an observational study with aspects of a randomized control trial that lies somewhere around here. So this has been um, the so-called self-blinding microdose study. What's a pretty cool study. And uh, with this, he sought to combine the advantage of observational studies in reaching high sample sizes at low costs uh, with the benefit of implementing a placebo control. So this is also a web-based observational global study, but has a placebo control implemented. So this means people who plan to microdose on their own behalf with their own drug, this is important, so we don't give out the drug, they have their own drug, they microdose at home, but, um, but they agree to participate in the setup manual of the study. And this will allow uh, to blind themselves in a more controlled manner. So we have a specific blinding procedure, participants will see, receive a manual um, with like specific instructions and will end up hiding their microdoses in non-transparent capsules. And um, they put together four randomized um, capsules with day labels, uh, put that into zip bags and end up with uh, four capsules that they put into a big envelope. This is, as you can see here, uh, then allocated to um, a week. So they prepare four envelopes with microdosing capsules and four envelopes um, in a mirror version with placebo capsules. Uh, and then people are uh, randomized um, and allocated to um, three experimental groups. So we have a placebo group, uh, a microdosing group, and a half-half groups where we have uh, placebo weeks intermittently mixed uh, with microdosing weeks. Um, so after all this labeling, mixing and randomly assigning the capsules, the participants will take them one at a time, uh, but they don't really know what they're taking. So they're blinded in that sense. Uh, and here um, uh, you can also see, so people completed uh, as well online questionnaires. Uh, we added cognitive tasks and predefined time points. And um, these were in this example happening at baseline four weeks, uh, five weeks and nine weeks after they started their microdosing regime. And when we look at the accumulative outcomes, that means that's longer term outcomes, they're not acutely measured, they're after they completed the microdosing. Um, you can see in the graph that participants in a microdosing group, that's the red line here, um, actually significantly improved over time. However, if you look at the placebo group here shown in blue, you see similar improvements. So similarly as the microdosing group, participants in the placebo group also significantly improved. And important here is that there were no significant group differences uh, and no interaction effects. That means um, even if it looks like that on this graph, um, the improvement in the microdosing group was not larger, statistically speaking, than in the placebo group. And the very same pattern can be found in all the other outcomes we have been assessing. Um, yeah, however, you could of course argue that the effects of a microdose are much more visible acutely. So we also looked at the acute outcomes um, that were assessments completed on a dosing day. Um, and at the end of a dosing day, participants had to, for example, in this uh, case, rate their mood. Um, and we stratified this data according to the condition in which participants were in. So whether they took a microdose or a placebo on the day is here, as you can see in the first row, and whether they guessed to have had a placebo or a microdose capsule. So as part of their questionnaire, they had at the end of it um, to guess if they think they had a microdose or placebo capsule on the, in that day. So in this first example, you can see scores for, a participant, for participants who had placebo capsules and correctly guessed to have been in a placebo condition. Here you can see scores for, for, for participants who had a microdose and guessed to have had a placebo. And here, interestingly, you can see that if participants guessed to have had a microdose, but in reality they had a placebo, there is a much like larger difference in the scores. And a similar pattern can also be found when participants actually had a microdose and guessed to have had a microdose. And this exact pattern was basically found for all of the acute outcomes. Um, so if you look here on, on the left, uh, if you compare the conditions, uh, placebo versus microdose, um, all these comparisons were not significant. But if you compare the guess, it seems that the guess is driving these effects as you can see in this difference here. 
So why is this, uh, oopsie, why is this relevant? So um, this study was particularly interesting because it's kind of the largest placebo controlled study on microdosing, but also on psychedelic drug use in general. So it was my email. Um, and this is a novel and cheap methodology to implement placebo control. And of course there are limitations because people are using their, um, their own drugs, some things we still have to address and has been mainly healthy volunteers and a few other issues uh, we want to address in future studies. But in, in conclusion, we could say the results really point into the direction that there's a large placebo effect uh, at play here. However, now I'm working on a study that is self-blinding version 2.0 and uh, we want to kind of modify the study design. It will also be an observational study with an additional layer of experimental control. So we want to invite participants from greater London area to take part in a study as soon as we launch it. Um, but it will also include only microdoses who microdose on their own behalf. And I can tell you later in the Q&A why that is the case at the moment. Um, it will also involve opportunistic recruitment, so we aim to include participants who may want to manage their mental health, um, so with slight mental health issues uh, would be good if we could assess them as well. And um, the exciting thing about this study is that we will add three lab visits, where we will invite people to come into the lab, and we will include more hands-on measures uh, like neurophysical, neurophysiological markers of brain activity, biomedical sampling, psychophysiological measures, and of course, cognitive tasks and behavioral measures. And yeah, this is uh, about to come soon. Um, you can keep up to date on our website. And that's it uh, for me for now. Um, thank you to my team and everyone who's involved in this amazing research. And feel free to ask me anything later. <laughs>